In 2012, we produced an episode about human trafficking. Seven years later, we're here again to discuss a new approach that Dignity Health is taking in providing education and training to healthcare providers in identifying and treating victims of human trafficking. Next, on Studio Sacramento. For over 20 years, Five Star Bank has created thoughtful solutions to help the capital region thrive. From economic development and education to public health and safety, issues that are vitally important to Sacramento's prosperity. We're proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. Dr. Chambers, when someone who is actively being trafficked shows up in a healthcare facility or clinic, what is the most important thing that a provider needs to keep in mind at that moment? Well, that's a really good question. And um, I think that you're already getting to probably one of the biggest points of why we're here is medical providers need education and training on this subject. Um, unfortunately, if you look at medical school curriculums and residency curriculums across the country, uh, healthcare providers, while we may be one of the few people in society that interact with people while they're being exploited or trafficked, there's no education or training provided to us. Um, and should we identify that person, there's not necessarily protocols in place that allow us to respond to that individual and do it in a way that is going to not put them in harm's way. And that's probably the number one thing I would say is, unfortunately, most people working in medicine, I think we want to help people and we want to do something good. And we hear something that sounds awful or an awful story. And our initial response is, we're here to help you. We're going to help you get out of that situation. And I think that term that people can fall into is called a rescue fantasy. If somebody falls into the rescue fantasy and says, I'm hearing this awful story, I'm going to help you but they don't have a system in place and they don't have the protocols built to appropriately do that, they could get halfway through that process and then have to put that patient back into the community and back into harm's way. So really having protocols set that allow us to do that is incredibly important. Well, I, I want to ask you, Jennifer, it, it seems to me, and maybe this is a bit naive, is that when people who are actively being trafficked show up in some sort of healthcare environment, m many would assume that it's obvious that that's what's going on with these people. Is it, is that a wrong assumption? Well, first of all, it's, as we know, it's a very hidden crime and it's a hidden situation. Um, when someone comes into a healthcare space who is being actively trafficked, um, oftentimes they can present, um, and that's why this education for providers and for healthcare staff is so important. Um, they could come in and it could be assumed that maybe it's a um, mental health condition, but it's not really related to the trauma they've experienced, um, not really looking beneath the surface on that, or coming in with some type of a injury, uh, but not really asking the questions that lead to that. And also, you know, victims, when they are coming into a healthcare space, when, if they're under um, a trafficker's control, it's rare that they can come to a healthcare space, but if it is, it's like drop them off. This is what we've heard from survivors. Go get that taken care of and get back out. Because as long as they're in there, they're costing them money. So they're not going to usually disclose. So it's really important to look at those things. Um, and, and Dr. Chambers, you can really add on to this is as a physician, it's not just about, oh, I'm looking for someone who has a controlling person with them, or I'm looking at a person who's entered the healthcare space. They don't have their own documents. They might not know um, what city they're in. They might not um, really know um, a lot of things about their history, um, but you're looking for other things as well. Yeah, right? set the stage for us, Dr. Chambers. Yeah, and, and I think that it's um, what we're talking about. A lot of people will look at the issue and I think most people can wrap their heads around the idea of somebody that's being forced into a situation against their control that wants to leave but feels threatened and can't get out of that situation. Um, many of the individuals that we interact with and that we treat that have experienced exploitation through human trafficking, both sex and labor, they, they, um, they really 
are meeting us at a stage in their lives where they may or may not even self-identify as a victim. Really? Yeah, yeah and that's, that's going to be... Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Um, and I, I might actually just step back and kind of give you a little bit of a background story, if that's okay. Sure, because sure. Um, if I look at the history of many of the patients that I treat in our clinic, um, they're coming from backgrounds of abuse and neglect. Mm -hmm. And these are very often individuals that have experienced both sexual, physical, you know, emotional, verbal abuse at home. And at some point in their lives, they decided that was enough and they hit the streets. And when I say at some point in their lives, very often it's when they're 11, 12, 13. Here in Sacramento, the traffickers know exactly where to pick these kids up when they hit the streets. And that trafficker may take that individual, that, that child, home with them. Um, they may be very nice to them for a period of time. They may wine and dine them. And then at some point, that trafficker gets mad and he just beats the bejesus out of this kid. Mm -hmm. And he'll take her, you know, off Auburn Boulevard along the railroad tracks. Um, he might strip her naked, dump her out on the railroad tracks um, behind a warehouse. He might pee on her, he'll get in his car and he'll drive off. And Oh my God. He, right, these stories can be horrific, but you think what's happening now, you've got this, this kid, freezing rain, naked, just beat up on the road tracks and the hours go by. Police don't know that she's there. Um, we don't know that she's there. Nobody swoops in to save this child. But the person that comes back and gets her hours later is gonna be that trafficker. And he takes her home and he draws her a warm bath and he takes her to dinner and he wines and dines her and he, he makes her feel good about himself or herself again. And, um, and you think about the psychology behind that because this doesn't happen once or twice. This happens again and again and again during the developmental years of this child's life. And as that person grows up, this creates something called trauma bonding. Um, a more technical term for that is trauma course detachment. And that really does create a psychologic bond to that trafficker that can be, in my opinion, just as strong as any chain. Is this the same as like what we've heard about the Stockholm Syndrome, or is it different? Right, right. A lot of similarities can mm -hmm. be drawn to Stockholm Syndrome. And, and the reason why I bring that into this conversation is because when we meet that individual, whether it be in our clinic, in the emergency room, in the labor and delivery ward, we may see the signs and symptoms of trafficking. Um, we've learned to identify the branding tattoos. We've well, yeah, tell us a little bit about these signs and symptoms. Mm -hmm. So Jennifer, you know, elicited a few of them there. Um, there can be anything from the controlling third party um, in the room. That third party may be same age, same sex individual, mm -hmm. or even younger age. Um, there can be, there's a, we have books of the tattoos we look for. There can be, um, many other more subtle signs, um, just the background the person's coming from, if they're not in control of their documents or money, if they're texting consistently throughout the exam. So there's, there's clues that we can pick up on. But then again, the important part is understanding that if that person doesn't self-identify as a victim, our role in that situation may not to be pulled, or may not be to pull that person out of that situation and quote unquote rescue them. Um, our role may be to say, this is a safe space. If and when you want help, we're here to help you. And that may be today, tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, but we have the resources to do it when you're so, ready. So that, that brings us to what is safe haven? So the medical safe haven, it's a term we call, it's an embedded clinic model. So we have an existing clinic here in Sacramento and it's a primary care clinic. So, and treating all patients, all ages. Um, the safe haven, denotes really about, um, it's a place where we provide what we call trauma-informed care. So physicians, the care team, everyone from the janitor to the person who greets uh, our patients from the front desk, um, the MAs, everyone there has been trained in human trafficking, understanding it, really removing that, any unconscious bias or you know misunderstanding of what it is, removing those myths associated with human trafficking, understand it and understand the unique needs that these patients have. So something as simple as when they come in, they don't wait in our waiting room for a long time. And that's because sometimes waiting or just sitting in a space and people looking can trigger them. Um, and we just wanna keep them kind of in this real safe space, build a bridge uh, of safety there, get them back into the room and a physician who meets with them, doesn't have judgment or stigma, just knows how to meet them where at where they're at, take time with them, be really patient, listen, ask the right questions. And they're trained on how to not re-traumatize, 
how to not re-trigger them. You know, so it's asking simple things like, you know, where did you grow up? And starting with those questions, and they might start unveiling, like, you might understand in just a few moments that they really were in a lot of different homes, a lot of places. Give us a distinction between an approach that does not re-traumatize <laughs> to, for a less enlightened mm -hmm. provider, mm -hmm. one that has not received the training, mm -hmm. what would be the, the type of thing that might trigger someone mm -hmm. that you're attempting to train out of them? Sure, well, simple. So something even within uh, Dignity Health, we talk about healing touch. You know, providers are, are talked about the, the healing touch. So just even placing a hand on, on, on a patient or talking. Trauma-informed approach is as simple as, and Dr. Chambers, you can talk to this as, as a provider in, in the clinic, but from my perspective and what I've heard, feedback from survivors who've been in our clinic, our safe haven, is you know, that doctor asked me, can I go ahead and place the stethoscope here? This is why, I need to listen. Or they actually told me why they were asking if I was exposed to particular drugs, like meth or cocaine or things like that. They explained to me why they were asking because they cared about my health. They cared about what I've been exposed to so that they know how to appropriately treat me. It wasn't done with just an assumption that I had been exposed to those drugs. It wasn't with an assumption um, you know, that I had a certain history. They just asked me in an appropriate way, a really dignified way. Just connected to my humanity. Does and that, that connection mm -hmm. really generates a meaningfully different outcome than yeah. would be typical. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that when we talk about trauma-informed care and, and you know, simply wording conversation, not, not what's wrong with you, maybe what happened to you, right? I mean, there's subtle differences in the way that we can approach a conversation with the patient, but um, down to even how we perform the physical exams. And, and I want to kind of even step back and say that the, the medical safe haven model that we've created, um, there's no protocol, there's no, there's no framework for how this should be done. Um, I can't open a medical textbook and, and read about how we should approach this patient population. And so as we've gone through this process, it's been a constant check and balance where we get survivor input and we constantly are, are getting feedback from the patients we're treating, the community agencies, survivor leaders, and we're being able to revamp the way that we um, encounter patients. And, and through these methods, um, which years back I would have thought were completely nebulous, like ambiguous topics, touchy-filly, don't, you know, couldn't affect patient care that much. What I've come to realize or what's come to fruition in my mind is that they are just as important, if not more important than you know, the algorithm to treat acute coronary syndrome. I mean, that's very easy, cut and dry, it's black and white, it's on paper. But by applying these concepts, we can get dramatically different patient outcomes. How so? Uh, do you have an example of, of this approach as opposed to the uninformed? And I, I don't mean to be, you know, offensive, but un, uninformed, untrained approach. Right, right. So, so. I can, I can tell you there's lots to these encounters that um, are not part of the stereotypical encounter. I mean, down to the medications we use when we use them for acute, complex, and chronic PTSD, um, how, we, how we mitigate that with that trauma course detachment that I spoke of. Um, you know, all of these different practices that we're doing, um, the outcomes are statistically significant, and this is the part that I'm really excited about. We, we're getting a lot of anecdotal you know, reports from patients, from our providers, from the community agencies that this is really helping and that, you know, this is being instrumental in these, these individuals going on roads of recovery and staying out really? of trafficking situations. We, we have enough data from some particular agencies that we can look at that data where they put patients, their clients through programs of recovery, basically out of trafficking. Um, by the time they go through their programs, it may take six months to two years, but they're really on a new path. They're out of trafficking, they have a stable income, stable living situation, all of these different parameters. Now their success rate was typically about 12% when they brought those individuals to any healthcare setting. When they bring those same individuals to our healthcare setting and we're being able to apply these principles and help manage that patient, their success rate goes up fourfold. Really? Fourfold to 52%. Um, which is a huge increase. And so again, these aren't things that currently exist in the medical literature that I've read. Um, and I try and read up and keep up on all of it. And um, so it's very exciting, this, this dynamic change that we can see with this patient population 
is incredibly innovative. And um, I mean so much so that I'm very fortunate that uh, the healthcare system, Dignity Health, and with the support of like wonderful groups, Mercy Foundation here locally, the philanthropy, you know, supporting this clinic, supporting this model, the Corporate Dignity Foundation supporting this model. These organizations have allowed us the support that we've built this framework and now we're being able to move it and replicate it in new areas. Well, it's interesting <clears throat> how the approach, you talk about it being touchy-feely, mm -hmm. but in many ways, mm -hmm. it harkens back to years ago in our first season, we had a, a woman on our show, on this show, Leah Albright Bird, who really focused on part of being in a place to receive help was being treated with, no pun intended, dignity. Yes. And it, it sounds like that there's actually been a bit of a pivot uh, among the people who, and professionals mm -hmm. like yourselves, mm -hmm. who interact with those who are trafficked, mm -hmm where rather than standing in judgment from a moral standpoint, you're really putting a medical or healthcare model mm -hmm. around the person and the person's condition that they're dealing with. So but that, that, that's a societal, I mean, that's kind of a sea change, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And really this model is, it's an extension, right, of our commitment to caring for the most vulnerable. You know, Leah Albright, I remember on that show, just talked about her place and the vulnerabilities and where she was at and, and really being unseen, right? And, um, and caring for those who've been really pushed out kind of to the margins by society is so important. Um, like Rana just talked about, you know, expanding this model of care is really, really important. It's had um, national recognition. We were able to do it through the Department of Justice, uh, Office of Victims of Crime Grant, and they're saying, yes, replicate this model because the more doctors you train, the more clinics that you provide and say, we're gonna be a medical safe haven, means people like Leah, when she was in her situation, could get the health care she needed without going into a place of judgment. So this model that, that you all are, have pioneered mm -hmm is being replicated and is gaining acceptance in yes. other geographies, other places? Yeah, and it's and also the, our best practices that we are learning about, I mean, since 2016, it is really impacting healthcare all across the nation because we are training, and Dr. Chambers is actively involved in training other providers across the nation um, at national conferences, and all of the, what we've learned, we've put into a manual that can be replicated, and we freely share it. We just say, access all of our materials. They're yours. Use these. Create these protocols. Um, when someone needs, you know, uh, health care is one of the top things that they need. Uh, first of all, it's to look at um, what he had talked about, you know, really that trauma, right? When someone is brought into an agency and provided a safe place, the problem is, that safe and quiet and surrounded place is when really their trauma most starts to activate. And that is a very uh, a hard place they're, they're having. They can't sleep. Uh, they're trying to connect with the staff there and they're just, it's just not normal for them. And so the protocols we put in place really respond to that. I'm really glad that you just shared that with us because one of the things that it raised for me is I wanted to ask, what is it that makes the healthcare environment the appropriate place to provide right. th this type of engagement? Right. Well, I will start this, and I know I want uh, Ron to, to extend on this, but first of all, most time, those we've heard from survivors, uh, when they were being actively trafficked and not out of a trafficking situation, most time they would go into an emergency department that's not really the right healthcare environment for them going in having something like a test or a treatment. Um, and so it was the wrong healthcare space. The medical safe haven built within a primary care clinic is the appropriate healthcare space where we can take more time, we can look at and treat them holistically, longitudinally. Um, it's really, really important to look at the, the healthcare environment. And the best part is this, this model is based upon communication with agencies in the community and everyone who has, has some type of a touch with a victim saying, this is here, this exists. And we've built in communication where it's very warm hand, it's very quick, it's very on time, where you call in, 
I, I got a text the other day, 14 year old. She needs support, she needs care. Um, she's pregnant, she's now at our, at our place, we need hair. Immediately we're able to get her in and start initiating those, that treatment for her. And when she comes in, it's safe because it's Mercy Family Health Center. It doesn't say human trafficking clinic or there's nothing there that's an identifier. Right. And if they're actively being trafficked or they're with their trafficker and they have a word that they can get in and, and get care, they're still coming into a clinic. It's a safe place. It doesn't have anything associated with it that would be alarming. Dr. Chambers, uh, uh, again, I, I want to come back though to the problem itself. Uh, years ago, when uh, we first started to cover this topic, Sacramento was known as one of the major centers for trafficking in this country. Is that still the case today? So I, I would be hesitant myself to speak to that. And the reason I'd be hesitant is because over time there's been a lot of um, a lot of speculation about the statistics and the numbers. I, I can tell you that at our clinic right now, um, we're providing about 700 patient visits a year um, for people who have experienced That sounds trafficking. significant. It's a lot. Um, but I, you know, that prevalency rate, I think what really happens is we become educated as we become trained on it. We do realize that we're seeing these individuals all around us in society all the time. You know, in front of me at the self-checkout line in Target, I'll recognize the tattoos, I'll recognize the interaction with the individual, and I'll say, well, shoot, there's a trafficking, you know, person currently being trafficked, um, and what can I do about it in this situation? Um, I, I would say that um, part of what Jennifer was saying about implementing this into the, the clinic, though, model that we have is at least within, I run a family medicine residency program, so I have 20 more, 24 family medicine residents. Um, what that means is that when an individual comes in to see us, if they were being trafficked last night and they're coming in with their child, uh, we can take care of them, we can meet their mental health and their physical needs, we can treat their child, we can provide the prenatal care, we can deliver those babies. Um, our medical assistants work as the doulas in those deliveries. When they get sick and they're hospitalized, we can work in the hospital and take care of them. So it really creates this one-stop shop where this individual can really feel safe with their provider. And it, when they, and that sounds like a very comprehensive, very thoughtful environment. I'm curious, Jennifer, there are other uh, actors in the community who provide services for folks. How, how does the program interact with them? Well, in this area, um, and really both places that I'm helping to support the replication, first of all, there is a coalition. So here in Sacramento, it's called SAC Together. It's the Human Trafficking Coalition. And really everyone comes to table there. So there's direct service providers. Like? So there could be City of Refuge, Weave, Opening Doors. There's um, Communities Against Sexual Harm. There's a number of agencies that give direct services. And I'm remiss because there's so many incredible agencies. I'm not saying them all and I want to list them all. There's uh, law enforcement at the table, those who are doing uh, sting operations and are saying, we're taking a trauma-informed approach. We're making sure an uh, 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 advocate is with us when we go and do these. And we want to help understand that we are looking now that these are victims. So we're all at the table talking what services we provide. And we sit there as healthcare saying, here's a direct number. When you pick up someone or you have someone that enters into your space, here's the bridge, right? Our physicians are trained, our team is trained. We're gonna provide dignity. We're gonna give them what they need. We never say no to anyone. Come on in. We are here at the table with you. This is the healthcare space. You do all of this, we do this piece, but this is how it's helping to impact. And so in Shasta County, where we are, and also LA County, there's coalitions that exist there, and that's what I did. I first started there. A lot of them are domestic violence, sexual assault agencies, right? and now they're providing services in human trafficking because our awareness has grown locally and nationally. And I think that we'll leave it there. Thank you both. Uh, what an amazing, impactful program. Good luck on its success and come back and share with us as it continues to grow. Thank you. All Thank right. You. And that's our show. Thanks to our guests and thanks to you for watching Studio Sacramento. I'm Scott Syfax. See you next time right here on KVIE.
over 20 years, Five Star Bank has created thoughtful solutions to help the capital region thrive. From economic development and education to public health and safety, issues that are vitally important to Sacramento's prosperity. We're proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. All episodes of Studio Sacramento, along with other KVIE programs, are available to watch online at kvie.org slash video.